Nonviolence section. The Great Game and the Continuity of Stereotypes. Waving the flag of nonviolence has now become a key element in this great game. Expressing his loathing for the humiliation inflicted on his compatriots by the colonial power, Gandhi transfigured the Indian people into the embodiment of a superior moral and religious tradition dedicated to Ahimsa, which risked being overwhelmed by the violent modernity of the West. In our day, as a champion of the Dalai Lama's cause, it is precisely the West that indirectly elevates itself into the guardian of Ahimsa, now seen as a characteristic element of the Tibetan, quote, tradition. Not only this, recently, Rabia Kadir, the leader of the Uyghur movement committed to stripping China not only of Tibet, but also Xinjiang, declared, quote, My model is Gandhi. And he added, quote, We are all gentle guerillas. The national character is mild. We know that violence breeds nothing but violence. End quote. Here then, we have another movement and another people who, so it would seem, unanimously renounce violence. The tradition invented here is even less credible. It is not possible to refer to Jainism or Lamaist Buddhism. Qadir is a Muslim a follower, in other words, of a religion that, from the viewpoint of the Islamophobia rampant in the West, is synonymous with violence. However, hosting, aiding, and generously financing the putative disciple of Gandhi, the West once again elevates itself into a guardian of Ahimsa, in opposition to China, which it aspires, if not to dismember, then at least to destabilize and contain. The violence of modernity reprehended in the West by Gandhi is now reprehended by it in China. Invested by a pervasive violence now invading nature as well, Chinese modernity reveals itself to be bereft of any spiritual dignity. There is a worrying history behind such stereotypes. Shortly after the mid-19th century, publishing his essay on the inequality of human races, Arthur de Gobineau drew a contrast between Tibetan culture and Chinese culture, which still seems to have a following today. On the roof of the world, argued the French author, spirituality played a major role. This was demonstrated on the one hand by the minor importance attached by Buddhism to the goods of this world and earthly existence itself, and on the other by the organization of society, which witnessed the paramountcy of castes uncontaminated by the production of material goods. At the antipodes was the Chinese population, composed of, quote, highly prosaic individuals. Hence, there was no room for an authentic religion and spirituality. Existence revolved around, quote, economics, calculation, prudence, the art of winning without ever losing, values bound up with the lowest notion of physical utility with material organization and material interests. That is why the Chinese population afforded a spectacle bereft of beauty or dignity. It does not wish to be diverted from the gentle digestive fermentation that is its sole preoccupation. End quote. By virtue of this intrinsic spiritual deafness and irredeemable banality, China was the country that prefigured socialism. Obsessed as they were with materialism and utilitarianism, should the socialists prevail, concluded Gobineau, Chinese mediocrity and vulgarity would end up being imposed on Europe. Writing some decades later, at the end of the 19th century, Houston S. Chamberlain painted a similar picture. The inhabitant of India and Tibet was, quote, in metaphysical terms, unquestionably the best endowed there has ever been. His antithesis was the Chinese, that insuperable model of the positivist and collectivist, who evinced little or no need for religion, and was incapable of producing poetry, art, and philosophy. In short, the Chinese might be defined as man become machines. End quote. For this very reason, he was a man who prefigured the horror of communism, 
quote, in the communist state of the Chinese, an animal-like uniformity obtains, end quote. As we can see, the Chinese embodied the irredeemably vulgar and herd-like spirit of communism well before the development of the revolution led by Mao Zedong. And now let us read the 14th Dalai Lama. The latter contrasts the, quote, humorless culture, culture, and the one-sided privileging of civilization, end quote. In conclusion, in contradistinction to the noble Indo-Europeans, we have, quote, the Semitic peoples, the Chinese, etc., end quote. The ideological motif we are reconstructing is now ready to be inherited by the movement that eventuated in Nazism, one of whose reference points was Chamberlain. While the West and the white race were threatened by the revolt of peoples of color and the Bolshevik Revolution, which had been extended from Russia to China, the political and military struggle was bound up with a kind of meditation, religious or para-religious on the origins of the Aryan and white race, now summoned to the decisive battle. Thus is explained the Third Reich's interest in, in fact, cult of Tibet, even in the years when the course of war seemed to have a monopoly on all thinking. Herr's expedition must be situated in this context. When he met the Dalai Lama, he immediately recognized and celebrated him as a member of the superior white race. Quote, his complexion was much lighter than that of the average Tibetan, and in some nuances, even whiter than that of the Tibetan aristocracy. End quote. By contrast, the Chinese were completely alien to the white race. That is why the first conversation His Holiness had with Herr was an extraordinary event. Quote, it was the first time in his life that he had been alone with a white man. End quote. Substantially white, the Dalai Lama was certainly not inferior to Europeans, and was in any event, quote, open to the influence of Western thought, end quote. Very different was the attitude of the Chinese, mortal enemies of the West. A minister monk of Holy Tibet confirmed it to Herr. He, quote, told us that in the old scriptures, it was prophesied that a great power from the north would overrun Tibet destroy religion, and make itself the master of the whole world, end quote. Having crushed a people guided by a leader who in his very skin color evinced his alignment with the West, the yellow peril now menaced the West as such and internally. Interpretation of the conflict pitting Tibetan exiles against the Chinese government slides from politics first into anthropology or ethnopsychology, with the contrasting of national characteristics, and thence into the doctrine of race. This dual slippage is even clearer in the leader of the Uyghur separatist movement. Having claimed that his people are unanimously composed of, quote, gentle guerillas, Kadir, speaking with an Italian journalist, continues, quote, quote, you see, you gesticulate like me. You have my white skin. You're Indo-European. Would you like to be oppressed by a communist with yellow skin? End quote. It might seem that there is an analogy, at least, with the first Gandhi, who, not having yet become conscious of the equal dignity of peoples, pursued the co-option and racial promotion of his compatriots by stressing their membership of the superior Aryan or Indo-European civilization. But today, there are two new elements. The aspiration to cultural and even racial co-option into the West, rather than representing a protest, albeit immature and misleading, against the dominant power internationally, is encouraged by the latter. Second, this aspiration is at the same time a contribution to the Western war ideology, and even to its most somber themes, which refer directly to the history of colonialism, and colonial racism. End section.